During just about the only scene in James Joyce's Ulysses, which I can claim to understand, a couple is trying to parse a Greek word. She says, met him what? And the man takes a stab at it, met him psychosis? And the woman says, who's he when he's at home? Who's he when he's at home? It's a takedown that's handed to us by the author. It's like saying, what does that word or person look like in the flesh? The poetry world equivalent of that scene might be the famous Allen Ginsberg reading when a heckler shouted, hey, Allen, what are you trying to prove? To which Allen said, nakedness, exit heckler. For the better part of five decades, Eileen Miles, whose homecoming we are celebrating today, has been taking us to, texting us to, walking and talking, and yes, even heckling us to, some of the nakedest places that language allows. Gwendolyn Brooks once said, we need a teller for a time like this. And I think Miles has become just such a crucial and compelling teller of our time because she has tapped into our changing nakedness, the different sites and sources of our vulnerability and virility, the shifting coordinates of our unease. She keeps finding the next opening in the national or personal or collective narrative through which to pierce the particular deficits of our attention, like I just did with that mic. In one of the first poems I ever read by her, an American poem, she interrupts herself mid-litany with this visceral census. Am I the only one with bleeding gums tonight? Am I the only homosexual in the room tonight? Am I the only one whose friends are, have died, are dying now? In singling herself out, as she knows Americans so often do, she manages to make numerous herself. Like Whitman's song of myself, what sounds at first like a solo undoes itself and sends out its electrons to connect. She is a member of those with bleeding gums. She is a member of those who love members of the same sex. She is a member of those the grass grows through the dead. The beginning of the poem opens with a hard knocks narrative and Miles shows us how readily we buy into tropes we are being fed. I was born in Boston in 1949. I never wanted this fact to be known. In fact, I've spent the better part of my adult life trying to sweep my early years under the rug. Carpet, sorry. Just when we think we're in the predictable arc of a Horatio Alger's tale, she confesses that she wanted to hide her past not because she's poor, yes, Miles talks about the C word class, but because she's a Kennedy. Suddenly the power dynamic shifts and we're not pitying her, pitying her, we're feeling a little less than. Then no sooner have we climbed down the rung of superlatives than she's telling us we're all Kennedys. Suddenly we've struck it rich and we all move over on the Group W bench. What she managed to achieve and what she almost always succeeds at is introducing us in those interstitial moments to our own nakedness, what we are without social constructs and hegemonies that protect us, if indeed we are among the protected. Recently, she described a kind of, quote, parental moment she had while sitting on the set of Transparent, watching her own poem being read for TV. The grown-up life it's leading, how it's hanging out in Cherry Jones's mouth. We feel we're in one of those safe spaces that have become all the rage, those spaces evacuated of edges or insult or anything sticking out, a space the PTA would approve of, when she suddenly observes to the journalist, my poem was working a lot more than I was sitting there in my tits. Figure out what in my tits does to you and you're halfway to your thesis on Eileen Miles, but you'll never finish it. This month's What's Brought Eileen Back to Boston is a fellowship at the Woodbury Poetry Room, one of the largest audio archives for poetry in the world. She's been in residence for almost a month listening to that most metempsychotic or transmigratory of things, recorded voices. Officially, she's there to work on a project that explores the Boston accent in and through poetry. But in many ways, she's also teaching us how to be here and to hear ourselves. Please welcome home Eileen Miles.
that was so great. Thank you, Christina. Um, I have to say the in your tits, in her tits line had to do with the fact that I was in an episode that was doing a send up of the Women's Music Festival. So I was trying, where I had never been, and so I was trying to be true to form, and so I actually spent like a whole, a whole afternoon of the shoot with my shirt off like everybody else did at the Women's Music Festival. But weirdly, the cameraman would not shoot them. <laughs> I was like, I have given this, you know, I've given them up, and, and they were not taken. Like some, I'm cropped like one of those kind of old school, you know, like yearbook pictures or something. Um, so, I, I think I have a title for what I'm gonna do. Um, and what I'm gonna do is talk a little about what, what's brought me back to Boston after being from Boston and doing some research at the Woodbury Poetry Room, which is the poetry library here at Harvard that has a lot of recordings. Um, and I'm already totally self-conscious about what Boston accent to have or not have, or um, I'm already imitating me. Um, I was born up the street at Mount Auburn Hospital. My dad was a postal worker at Story Street in the square, um, which is so weird because the post office is gone now, but uh, it's a different building. But the, little, the lovely little houses on the right side are still exactly there. So we would sit there and wait for my dad, and those same buildings are there, but not the post office. Um, and I worked at, um, in my Catholic school uniform in the 60s at the Harvard Coop when they sold ties and stationaries at the front. And all of that defines me as a townie, a word I think people outside of Boston may use, but I think it's mostly a Boston thing. In the same way that a package store used to be a packy, and maybe it still is. Did you go to the packy? Warrior from the other side of the hill, that's, that's my title. And that's warrior with an A, not an O, um, though I guess I'm a warrior too. Um, it's the title, I'm get, um, and I'm getting to, and I got part of it from Jim Dunn, who took me on a, a, a poet from Boston, who, t who took me on a walk on the other side of Beacon Hill, where some of the poets, um, John Wieners and, and um, Steve Jonas are two, I want to talk about, lived in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. And it was the wrong side of Beacon Hill, which I think, and I think there's no wrong side now of Beacon Hill, which is, is a sort of erasure, because if there's only one side, where did the other side go? <laughs> And there's a geographic loss. If there's a hill and you go up and you go down and nothing happens, it's a very serious loss. If there's just a good side, then that's not even a hill. <laughs> I left Boston for New York in 1974 and I realized I had a distinct accent that would tell you something about me and I actually decided to commodify it, which didn't mean anybody was buying my accent. But in the 70s, there was Bruce Springsteen and there was Patti Smith, working class kids who were very much being heard. And I, think I, and I think deciding to be that, to deliberately represent what you actually did represent, was in a way like preserving the bad side of the hill and saying it was good, calling it mother. So th I guess some recordings to play, and this one's John Wieners. <laughs> we rehearsed, I'm really bad at tech. Nah. Oh yeah, got it. My mother, talking to strange men on the subway, doesn't see me when she gets on at Washington Street. So I hide in a booth on the side and watch her worried, strained face the few years she has got left. Until, at South Station, I lean over and say, I've been watching you since you got on. She says in an artificial voice, Oh, for heaven's sake, as if heaven cared. But I love her in the underground, her gray coat and hair, sitting there, one man over from me, talking together between the wire grates of a cage. Now, was he really talking about his mother, or was it like when you're driving and you see a sweet dead animal on the side of the road and you think, baby? It's an involuntary tenderness for life for any woman of his mother's generation who, probably, who said probably like his mother said, oh, for heaven's sake, as if heaven cared. In a way, that's my whole talk right there, <laughs> that cared. It's a literal linguistic space, almost a rub. You probably know, all know this. They call it non-rhotic, the ah that doesn't sound after a vowel, post-vocalic, they could say. And the story is that in the 16th century, the people who came to Boston were British and increasingly 
they, by the 17th century, were country people, and the soft R is rustic. It's simply that. It's a piece of English speech that's stuck here. And interestingly, isn't the Boston accent the major export of the city? People like to point out that it used to be understood as an upper-class accent, and governors from previous generations, mainly a guy named Peabody, um, had the accent, and Kennedy had the accent. Uh, but, and this is so interesting. Somebody in the earlier 20th century decided to see if there was a Harvard accent and how it developed, say, from your freshman year to graduation. So somewhere in, in Harvard, there's recordings of like decades um, of these recordings, and one could actually find Kennedy sound-wise, a famous Boston export, and see how his accent developed in four years. But I can't help thinking that to not lose a Boston accent was his own kind of, because you think, I mean, like, by, this, by the time he was president, did he really have a Boston accent, you know? Um, but that was his own kind of commodifying, isn't really the word, politicizing, owning, but lingering on a sound or a sound system that sounds like home, and even resist banishment of that from which you would present to the world. I come from here. And that's the kind of thing you'd want to say again and again. Wiener's mother talked in an artificial voice as if heaven cared. He loved her in the underground, her gray coat and hair, sitting there. He returns to the sound, almost patting it. In a way, it makes English a romance language, extending the vowel so that there's a more musical inline. I'm just saying. One of the ways that they know that the 17th century people were using the soft R is that the language hadn't been standardized, so George would be spelled without an R. And, and, and of course, it meant it's, it, sounded, it, was like, it sounded like George, um, or it rhymed with dodge, right? Um, my mother, who is still alive, who is 95, and I, but I think that that whole, that whole dissonance right there, I mean, like, as, as somebody who grew up in Boston and learned to read in Boston and learned to write in Boston, there was a real problem because I'd hear George and then I'd look at a sign and it was George, you know? So I was just like, well, which, which is it, you know? And even early on when I first started writing poetry, there was kind, I had kind of an impulse to, like when I wrote Stott, I'd want it to look like Stott and so I would make it S-T-A-H-H-T, you know? And I knew it was sort of wrong and I knew it was, t it was somehow, um, loose even, and that it wasn't gonna take me where I wanted to go, but there was a way in which that dissonance, and I think that is, that is language itself, and, and what really happens and doesn't happen in poetry, which is the body and the, the, body and the word, and how is the body disclosed and not, not disclosed at the moment of writing, you know? Because of course, the absence of an accent in writing um, becomes the, on a certain level, the accent of the body. I mean, the, the absence of the body. Um, and then, okay, well, I'll get to it. Uh, my mother, who is still alive, who is 95, used to make con chowder, and it was almost an ingredient, the, si the silent R. Like, if I, think, if I think about con chowder someplace, I, I think if it wasn't pronounced correctly, I would think it wouldn't taste the same. <laughs> I heard a woman say about her friend, there's nothing to her, but of course it sounded like to her. I thought a whole other gendered sound, and so it's like, there's nothing to him. There's nothing to him. And yet, if you want to emphasize it more at the end, you'd say, nothing. There's, noth there's nothing to him. Nothing. Because in a way, everybody's doing drag. You know, everybody is doing their accent really consciously. You know, and so if you really want, I mean, it's like the accent and the absence of the accent becomes part of, part of like emphasis and how you would put weight on us. Um, Putting it on, putting it off is how you would put weight on a word and weight on your intention. Um, these are things that are as entirely articulate as expressions which tell it all by gesture and silence, these shifts. And language is silence too and tone. So Jackie, Jackie Wang and I are going to talk about Boston and poetry. And I knew very little before I moved to New York about poetry, but somewhere I encountered the poetry of Margot Lockwood who then and today lives in Brookline and has been on the poetry scene here since the 70s. As far as I know, I mean, Margot could be here from the earlier than the 70s. Before the 70s? 60s? When did you come? Uh, I was born in 1939 in St. Elizabeth's Hospital. Of course, in Brighton. And I came back after my father was welding ships in the war, came back to Brookline in, when I was seven. And when did you enter something that resembled the poetry world scene? 
you wouldn't believe this. Um, my husband was a stone lithography printer, and he said, Ma, and he said, Margo, in Brooklyn, he said, what was the girl here? They got all these poets over there. Just get me 10 poets, 10 poets. So I got Robert Lowell, Ann Sexton, you know, abundances. And I met Gordon Kearney, and he said, just sit here, just sit here and keep your mouth shut, and in, in an hour and a half, you'll meet 25 poets. And when was this? That was like 1962. Cool, okay, let me talk about you now. <laughs> now that you've been the expert, it was. Um, and so Margo's been on the poetry scene since 1962. <laughs> I mean, I mean, a female poet writes from a different position in the world, and not just, and it's, a, it's so interesting. I mean, I'm, like literally, if you're thinking about photography and putting the subject in the center of the picture and putting the subject to the side of the picture, in some ways is how I sometimes think about the, the positionality of the female poet, you know, that you don't, you don't write from the absolute same place. Um, so a female poet writes from a different position in the world, and not just because Margot calls the poem that you're gonna hear anonymous, which is another way of calling, you know, that, that cliche of like, paintings will be untitled. For poetry, it'll be called poem. That's how you untitle. Once in a while, when I was young, I'd be a brat and call a poem untitled. But really, it's like if you want to untitle a poem, you say poem, um, which is kind of front-loading the form. But, but in this case, by calling the poem anonymous, she's calling it woman. Anonymous was a woman became such a feminist cliche in the 70s that you forgot how the first time you heard it you thought, oh my God, of course. Or was it black? But it also says poem, it says the generic thing, it says instrumentality. Poem was authored by the, invisual, by the invisible. I really like this poem. Uh, this one is um, called Anonymous and it's to the women. The volume sucks. I did time with marriage, time when my beauty, if it was, I think was youth, you it again. and it bloomed, and in pregnancy. Thank you guys. Or we could just have Margaret come up here and read it. <laughs> no. Not for your ad lib in Christmas. This one is um, called Anonymous, and it's to the women. I did time with marriage, time when my beauty, if it was, I think was youth, and it bloomed, and in pregnancy upon pregnancy, twice and twice over, grew flaccid, and my face paled, and my eyes for years were gray or faded blue. Now I pick up men as I browse through bookstores, Aware as I finger their spines thoughtfully, men's books, that there could be some ideas and energies too swift and dark for my handling. With men and ideas, that's half the charm, and only certain kinds of men understand me or my ideas, and that's my charm if it's that, and not just wildness or swiftness or darkness. And one of the interesting things, of course, is, is it was probably shocking to Margo herself because that was a recording from the 70s. And, no? No, I don't know where it was. Yeah, yes, I, I, I know then. I think it was 72, um, which is so weird because when I hear recordings of myself decades, or, like your voice changes in time, you know? And, and it's this thing that we know, we know this about Billie Holiday. That's like, oh, that was late Billie Holiday, or that was, you know, um, was his name after he lost his teeth, you know, that jazz singer, or was it Chet, Chet, Chet Baker, yeah, I mean, but it's like so true of a poet, like I remember when I first got to New York and heard older poets, and you just hear like the mic'd voice of that, I mean like already, because I toured, I toured my ass off this year, my voice is changing, you know, I sound like I smoke, and I haven't smoked for years, you know, so it's just like the instrument itself changes and it holds all this stuff. Um, but I swear the first time I heard Margot's poem, I heard a Boston accent, and I think I heard it again more today, um, because I think her accent, your accent isn't so much on the R's as in the whole register, which is a kind of a Boston nasality, which you may have had before you came to Boston, but um, 
I spoke to Margot last night and she explained that her mother came from Philadelphia. It seems like math for me, this poem, the way the poem keeps repeating and diminishing, trying to create a formula for what she's already in. The rhythm felt like one I recognized, um, and I mean recognized intuitively, and I copy it somewhere in all of my work. I read like that, I get stuck, and the needle keeps repeating the poem, copying a sound I like, because that's like home. Steve Jonas, who's gonna take us out as a black poet and a gay poet, and like Wieners, he lived on the wrong side of the hill. I asked Christina Davis if there were any Boston poets of color in the collection I might not know about, and Helene Johnson came up, who was the only female member of the Harlem Renaissance who had a baby, which is kind of incredible. In 1987, she did not so much give a reading in New York, but she recorded a cassette at home, and she handed it to her daughter, Abigail McGrath, who played it one night at a theater. So that tape is somewhere, Christine, <laughs> but not at Harvard. We gotta find this tape, right? Um, her career, interestingly, her career lasted from ages 19 to 28, you know? And, and again, you think in the history of poetry, like, again, when I was coming up, I was always aware of who stopped writing poetry when, like Arthur Rimbaud f famously stopped at what, 19 or something? And um, uh, Laura Riding stopped in her 30s, deciding that poetry was inherently dishonest you know, and, and Keats died at 28, and so we're all kind of very aware of when poets stop. But this is an instance, of, officially, of a poet stopping because she got married and had a baby, you know, and her public, I think she published her, her last poem at 35. And the, the, the thing that's fascinating is that supposedly she wrote a poem every single day of her life and her daughters witness it, and that all those papers are in the Schomburg Library in New York. So I think we've got several books of her, but I think it's a big fat volume coming, and she's an amazing poet. Um, she came from Roxbury, Dorchester, and someplace around BU, summered on Martha's Vineyard with her cousin Dorothy West, who I only know about because I met this woman at the Summer of the Y who told me about her. You know, like, you know, you, you lie on the mat and somebody's on a machine and you decide to make each other talk. And she's like, you from here? And I'm like, you from here? And then she's like, I was like I'm, no, I'm, I'm not from here, but I'm doing something at Harvard. She goes, really, what? You know, and I told her and she was like, Dorothy West? And, that began a whole other chapter of my research. Um, Dorothy and Helene sublet their new friend Zora Neale Hurston's apartment in Harlem one summer. Where, well, Zora, can you imagine? Like, what are you doing? You, they, they, they lied to their mother. They were supposedly staying at the YMCA, in the, at YWCA in New York, but they paid the rent and then secretly were really staying at Zora Neale Hurston's apartment. Um, well, Zora, Zora Neale Hurston did folkloric research down south. I'm going to read a couple of her poems. She was educated and was from a much more upper class background than, for instance, white me. She was the grandchild of a slave. Vernacular means the language of born slaves. So when I, and I, and I, I love that fact and I'm fascinated, I mean, it's, you know, it's in the word, but is the implication um, that you, and I think the implication is that you have no, you have no other choice. I think that must be what it means. But I also wonder if the implication is that it's not written you know, that it's entirely a spoken language. Um, the sound, the sound that is not written. And again, to throw us back onto Boston poems of a certain generation or of a certain stripe, John Wieners, on a certain level, is writing the poetry that's not written because what we hear is not in, on the page. But um, the, the sound is vernacular. Um, yet the history of music and poetry, and the history of poetry and music and culture is moved by the vernacular, not the official, or even the official moved by the vernacular, like Robert Lowell. You know, it was like the big revolution, right, in poetry. We're like, oh my God, Robert Lowell's including real things and talking about life, you know? But it was like, Allen Ginsberg was the revolution, but somehow it wasn't, it didn't become mainstream until Robert Lowell did it. You know, like, you just gotta do it a little bit, you know? Um, official poetry moves really slow, but the vernacular is swift. So here's a couple of poems by Helene Johnson, which, so s sadly, I will read them since she's not here. And we don't, obviously, again, we don't know if she had a Boston accent. But I think we've, I, and, you know, the thing that's wonderful about looking is you start finding things that have not, nothing to do with what you're looking and you wind up someplace else that is more interesting.
This is a very short one that, that it's called the, the, the street to the establishment. You're the old, I'm the new. I'm the multi, you're the few. You're the gain, the attained, the begun, the become. The prize that's been won, the pick from the witch. You're the plot of the mural on the wall, the spire that cannot fall. I'm the aborted, I'm the itch. Just like, it's incredible. And this one, And I take responsibility for being the white person reading the black poem, but what's so interesting, I mean, there's so many things interesting about this poem is, is that, again, she's, she's doing vernacular too. It's like, it's such, a, it's, such a, it's such a kind, in the same way that I can hear myself putting my accent on and off helplessly and then sometimes deliberately, and she's doing that um, with blackness and dialect. Poem, it's called Poem. Which again, I feel like is totally a kind of a informing the poem with a certain kind of formality to say that I know, you know, that this is a formal statement. Little brown boy, slim dark, big eyed, crooning songs to your banjo down at the Lafayette. Gee boy, I love the way you hold your head high sort of and a bit to the side, like a prince, a jazz prince. And I love your eyes flashing in your hands and your patent leathered feet and your shoulders jerking the jigwa. And I love your teeth flashing and the way your hair shines in the spot like, like it was the real stuff. Gee brown boy, I loves you all over. I'm glad I'm a jig. I'm glad I can understand your dancing and your singing and feel all the happiness and joy and don't care in you. Gee boy, when you sing, I can close my eyes and hear the tom-toms just as plain. Listen to me, will you? What do I know about tom-toms? But I like the word sort of. Don't you? It belongs to us. Gee boy, I love the way you hold your head and the way you sing and dance and everything. Say, I think you're wonderful. You're all right with me. You are. She's so good. Um, and some of her power, some of her power, I think, was to um, was to repulse a little, and I mean to repulse bourgeois blacks, because this is in the 20s and the 30s, where there was a whole edict gone out, like don't be acting like those blacks. We're like proper blacks, um, and she's trying to she's trying to repulse. She's trying to be rustic. In the black poetry of the 20s, an impulse to button up and not shame the black race was prevalent. Helene's impulse was to almost invite disdain in the name of life, possibly sex, possibly praising all of her life, um, a way that might not sacrifice its vi vitality in exchange for acceptance. And what is class but to pass? Steve Jonas, the only mixed race poet I have recordings of, I think is not from Boston. And, and it just goes into another whole layer of the interestingness of an accent and language. Um, because the sound, a, a certain Boston sound inhabits him. He wraps his poems, makes it of stuff familiar, the soft, spacious A, you know? And so it's sort of like, in a case, I mean, he was from Atlanta, I think, originally. And, um, and, I, and I think, to, to think of coming here and acquiring an accent as a, as a street cred thing, as a way to as a way to buy drugs, as a way to be heard, as a way to as a way to pass, um, and so I'd like to end with Jonas, and then I'm going to read my own poems for about ten minutes. Um, and I just before I and before we hear Jonas, I just want to say that the I've been you know run you know the the weeks that I've been here, I've been running around with a number of poets and scholars um, from, from this area, and they're Joe Tora and Jim Dunn and Christina Davis and Margot Lockwood and Josie Packard and Garrett Lansing are my buds. And so, and now is, so we're going to hear Steve Jones for about five minutes and just kind of relax into it. What was that? This is going to be loud. Oh, all right. Which one? This one. Uh, this is Stephen Stephen Jonas reading for the Harvard Poetry Room on July tenth, nineteen sixty nine. First poem is Love, the Poem, the Sea, and Other Pieces Examined by Me. Not so much for receiving stolen goods as for placing the junk, dead as a world, before the senses. 
In such times, one is put upon within. You know how we squeeze today for meaning the few words we have left to us. Here, in a word, is the sea before me, but the sea cannot be squeezed. So I sit as close to it as close is safe. The sea speaks, if speech be sound, but speech is not sound, mm -hmm. so turns for meaning to the poem. If the sea is anything, it is deep in silence. Below and beyond, a few pebbles chatter thrown against sand, thalassa. The Greek reminds us, but the Greeks are profound and too elude us, and no one likes to be found out. In a dead world, as matter, of course, California becomes a sun symbol. I supposed you born there, so in thought I leap, thinking to rush up gladly to greet you, just as would any another creeping thing. Along Washington Street, the stores will close in an hour. The sparrows are hopping about the grass by, to say it's green, I suppose, and alive, with parasites I do not see. Being birds, these things do interest, or they do not. They are still birds. St. Francis, indeed, you were a fool. For had not you, we would all of us go screaming mad down the street, so serious are we come to take ourselves. Love, we say, but the flower we see arose edges by degrees, the secret locked tight within the unfold of bud. The hedge, that is the sea, defines its limits. In life, love, that switchblade belly thrust. Be quick, say what you will, death is slowly withdrawing the blade of life. Also love, if in life I am ever in love, I am consumed. Choice, I shall with doubt bloom in my season, and bloom be blown out to sea are up where the other gas. Heaven, that is to come in the Hollywood of the end. But we have before tasted those ecstasies of extreme unction. So let you and me keep it clean and simple, complexity not to be involved. Poem is the child's ear, and love is naked and unashamed to cry that it is not fondled. This reminds me that the sea cries, its cry is merely a surface noise. Its secret is much deeper, but men are no longer interested in the sea of their mind. They have visions of other worlds. Accurately numbered, they visit them daily in papers and in the meantime plan within a decade to shoot the moon. Good, as it is a dead issue, in this they at least show foresight. Let them get out of the world whatever means they may. Not by any long shot, is the sea dismissed from the mind. For a time, the sea defines the mind's periphery, but after a time, the sea is all around you and over their worlds. When you speak of B. Donahue, I think always the Irish sea. His horses are also the seas. Though we do bet our heart to come by resources of life, the sea takes us horse and rider in every race. It must be thus and so tragedy enters our lives. Not so much B. Donahue as the Greek, who also had notions of other worlds, but continued to live by the sea, as their language, which I have had of records, attest. Today, science fiction, yes, but the real sea, throwing hints as pieces of driftwood, the twisted gray remains, burn or preserve as whatnots. They give warmth or they give chill. Mike, I have seen pieces of driftwood, too, so twisted together, you and I would be hard put to extricate. How can I so subject our two lives to so trivial a thing, a twisted freak thrown together in the sea of unconcern to be discarded on some obscure beachhead of our world? It is fat summer here, and the ducks quack because of it. The birds will no longer come to investigate the grass. They work by signals, as we poor things pour over our signs for some parasite of meaning. It has been a lean season for you and me. I did not intend a serious poem, but the poem has a will all its own. I am a poor vehicle, a transport in summer wear. I too to be discarded also in the season of decline. Love, O oh self will love, though unworthy, remember me kindly at the hour of decline. Know that I sacrificed all to say nothing. Hereafter, it will be dark, stark winter. Every sign indicates it. In the long night, there will be time enough to think what pigs we have made of ourselves.
to think what pigs we made of ourselves is incredible. So, oh, and I want to thank Harvard too, and and uh, my friend Dana Chicatello for making this all possible. And you guys, of course, are coming. So let me read a couple of poems, and um, and then Jackie and I will talk. This is called a gift, a gift for you. Around 5.30 is a peaceful time. You can just hear the dog lapping. David lifts his smoke to his lips forever, dangling chain in the middle of everything, about the top shelf or so. The party at which I said, that's my collected works, and everyone stared my home was so small. Is it? I'm not particularly into the task of humility at the moment, but I'm not against it. It's like that deflated beach ball on a tiny chair. I think of as joking with the larger one on a painting floating in air. My home is large. Love made it large once, not to get all John Wieners. And believe me, love made it small once. This place only had sex unlike the house. I love a house. I fear a house. A house never gets laid. Frankly, who doesn't like a hotel room? I live in a hotel room, a personal one. A young person very much like me was brutal. No personal photographs, please. It was anyone's home, perfect for a party. Now I'm going fast. How the description of a drug enters a room and changes the room thus, with going fast, say thus, if you want to go slow. To drink the wrong thing for a moment, for you to lick my thigh and your honey face. I met a dog named Izzy once. I met a dog named Alan, the calm person writing her calm poems now and then. She shows her sacred heart. She opens her chest and a monkey god is taking a shit, swinging on his thing. It was like censorship. Somebody sneezed when I said shit. It was... You didn't know I had so much inside me, buckets of malice, Bibles of peace. I don't want to go all library on you now, like my mother, the mother of God, or my brother named Jack, who sat in a deck of cards getting hard. When she squeezes in getting cozy, I know less what I want to say. I can open an entire room comes out each moment. That's what I mean, not things widen and flow. There's no purpose to this. A couple of little love poems. This one's called You. I'm bravely eating my croissant at everyone. I'm living on my wet board. I'm living on my money, limits set, and the lights lower. I worship the blue marks on the hydrant. How like the name of a flower. This one's called May 26th. I keep tiny gestures, sweet William, dazzling orange sky. My, 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 dying New York. My mother's slowly dying, and, and I think part of the same um, disdain, I mean, I love my mother, and there's some way in which trying to write about my mother dying makes me want to say horrifying things. Um, and I was just, I was sitting in the room with her, and then I just was trying to write, and then I thought, this is so horrible, like writing at your, you know, perhaps dying mother. Failed appointment. If I thought I couldn't write in you ever, throw her out, I did. Time for something new. Your short, broken self requires a brand new weapon. Skinny old lady, ankles, nobody sees them. You are my private furniture. We're shocked at her ass, and a bill is stuck to the wall with a knife. At least once we joked about piggies. We were her kids and pretended to care about other people's hearts. This is like an old poem that I think, I totally think this is so influenced by Margot. It's called Sorry. I can't remember the second time I hurt you. It was dark, and someplace in that darkness was a thing I did. But you weren't the target, I know that, though you might have been the bow, and the tension I really think is love. Nothing ever sends me away. I got your pain in my pocket, and it glows in the dark, and in the light it's the softest kind of singing woman's voice. That's who you are, to me, I mean. Let me hold your shoulders back so you look arrogant and beautiful, welcoming me welcoming me into the warm, sad party. Let this be the unfortunate hat I hang outside the door, if only you'll allow me to come in. I did something so horrible. <laughs> um, 
This is one more new one, and then I'll read a couple from my book. Um, and the thing that's, this poem's called Western Poem, and the thing that's sort of cool about this poem is I went to UMass Boston, and part of the um, education that was fantastic there is we had a class called Irish Literature. And what it was, what it basically was, was a reprieve for working class Irish kids who only knew from like Danny Boy and just the whole leprechaun Irish American culture. And suddenly we were being exposed to James Joyce and O'Casey and Sing and also Welsh poetry. And so there was this beautiful um, um, Welsh Penguin book of Welsh verse that we read. And there was these amazing poems that, I've, um, that were very moving to me called um, gnomic stanzas. And what it was basically was like a nature poem that would then say something pithy and moral like, a branch falls, the guilty flee, though no man pursueth, you know? And I was like, that's so great. And, um, and, and, you know, and then 40 years pass, and then I move to Marfa, Texas, and I'm like so crazy about the landscape that I write this poem. This is totally gnomic. So this is a Western poem. Purple clouds, my doubts. Iridescent cream, my loss. Purple mountains, my friends. Buzzards circling overhead, my hopes. Birds singing, jagged singing, my indecision. Wrecked skinny tree, my past. Photographs I send home, my indiscretion. Amber street light, my reading. My appetite, my appetite. Red striped sky, my confusion. Bright yellow gray sky, my ardor. Car lights, my commotion. Telephone pole, my wishes. Stop sign, my fear. Family dollar, family dollar. Courthouse, my opinion. Black cloud, white sky, hesitation. Black cloud, white sky, bliss. Blinking signals, my intentions. Black mountains, too many suggestions. Skipping white lines, my attention. A young cowboy first saw the lights. A young cowboy first saw the lights. The horns on your van. My defensiveness, that old train. My dreams, that old train. And if you know Mafra, there's so nothing there that the train comes through five times a day and it just wails and the whole town is like, it's like the bells in another town. It just absorbs the whole town. It's so gorgeous. And then you're stuck at a traffic light looking at it, you know, like you're Instagramming it. Um, so let me read a, a couple of um, historic miles from my selected and then, and then Jackie and I will talk. This is this is sort of a sorrowful poem called "What uh, I wrote this in Belfast." What tree am I waiting? That whole part of the world where I won't go anymore, that whole separation that I won't feel, high in this house, in this hemisphere, in this artificial light that is artificial, in the earliest morning, dark in pages and pens, in an unfamiliar bed, in the foot curl, furniture, each rumble, when morning comes and it's still morning and it's still night. I married a dead girl, we were born in her bloom. Remember that fat bumblebee landed on a lamp, I opened the doors and I forgot and the house got colder and colder. Where is this house? The seam between boards merely gains my attention. It's dark and thin, I monitor each situation, my bladder growing full, climb down, climb up, what tree am I waiting? My whole life in weather, waiting for my raft. I'll fly to another island, I'll take a train. Already I know it will hurt. This is the hurt country. I came here to hold the hurt like a bird, like a tree. Traffic has rings, we watch it whirl around, damaging our night. Great continents hold the feelings and the ages. What is mine, going blind? Great masses of them not going home. The country drew a line because of memory. One said, I feel my heart race ahead. In eternity, there is this ache, there is this wakefulness. And this one's a little nasty in a good way, um, which is to say on my block in New York, there's like a new, um, a new taco joint called um, El Dub, is it? I can't remember the name of it, Dublito? It's the devil. What is it, El Dublito? Thank you, <laughs> I was like, that was great. Um, so I, I, you know, I would endlessly go in there waiting for my taco, and then endlessly a uh, devil would start to show up in my poem, you know, because it's, it was kind of this new satanic moment. And then this one time I went and I didn't have either phone or, I, I had like the shittiest 
pencil to write with, which is, I mean, I write by hand, so it was a very unpleasant feeling, the communication between paper and um, pencil. So prophesy. I'm playing with the devil's cock. It's like a crayon. It's like a fat, burnt crayon. I'm writing a poem with it. I'm writing that down. All that rattling heat in this room, I'm using that. I'm using that tingling rattle, that light in the middle of the room. It's my host. I've always been afraid of you, scared you're God and something else. I'm afraid when you're yellow, tawny, white it's okay, transparent, cool, you don't look like home. My belly is homeless, flopping over the waist in my jeans like an omelet. There better be something about feeling fat. What there really is is a lack of emptiness. I'm aiming for that empty feeling. Going to get some of that, and then I'll be back. And of course, this was in Poetry Magazine, and of course, you know, everybody's on Twitter. So, disgustingly, they tweeted, my belly is homeless, flopping over the waist of my jeans like an omelet. I was like, motherfuckers. I was just like, how could that be, like, great, you know? I was just like... Um, I was like, thank you. This is... And this is the only authentic, um, Allen Ginsberg wrote, late in his life, he was at the harmonium singing these blues songs. We were like, why is he doing that? You know, I'm like, six, in my 60s now, I love blues. I'm like, blues is so great. So this is my one, it's called harmonica. Um, I'm not gonna do the um, Robert Lowell or the Kennedy poem. I think you, the book, you could buy the book at the Harvard Bookstore. You could read the Lowell, you can read the Kennedy poem. Um, this is called Harmonica. I mean, those are like my hit poems and I use the Boston accent, but I think that would too, be too much like singing for my supper. <laughs> Harmonica. I don't wanna put my glasses on because I don't wanna see. Don't wanna move again because I don't wanna live. Don't wanna love again because I don't wanna lose. Don't want to eat again because I don't want to be full. Don't want to drink again because I don't want to feel quenched. Don't want to sleep again because I don't want to wake up. I don't want to live in the summer again because I don't want to be hot. Don't want you to kiss me again because I don't want to be alive. Don't want you to see me again because I don't want to vanish. Don't want to ride my bike because I don't want to get there. Don't want to know my family anymore because I don't want to remember me. Don't want to walk my dog because I don't want to be out. Don't want to stay in anymore because I don't want to be alone. Don't want to be tired anymore because I don't want to feel old. Don't want to eat candy anymore because I don't want to feel sweet. Don't want to talk to my friends anymore because I don't want them to know me. Don't want to sing anymore because I don't want to hear me. Don't want to die anymore because I don't want to see God. Don't want to live anymore because I don't want to repeat. Oh, that was the, great, the greatest thing Helene, um, Helene Johnson said. Like, so she was kind of, so she kind of went into private writing and she kept writing. And yet every now and then a scholar will be like, knock, knock, knock. Are you Helene Johnson, a member of the Harlem Renaissance? You know, and um, at one point when somebody cornered her, they were like, um, um, is this exciting for you when you're contacted by people about your work? And she was like, I'm never surprised by repetition. Which is <laughs> like, it's such a great tough old lady thing to say, right? Um, I'm going to read a few more, and then this one's called Shh. I don't think I can afford the time to not sit right down and write a poem about the heavy lidded white rose I hold in my hand. I think of snow. I went to night in Boston, drunken waitress, stumble on a bus that careens through Somerville, the end of the line where I was born, an old man shaking me. He could have been my dad. You need a ride? Wait, he said. This flower is so heavy in my hand. He drove me home in his old blue Dodge, a thermos next to me, cigarette packs on the dash, so quiet like Boston is quiet, Boston in the snow. It's New York, plates are clattering on St. Mark's Place. Should I call you? Can I go home now and work with this undelivered message in my fingertips? It's summer. I love you. I'm surrounded by snow. This one's called Writing. I'm basically reading you now what I think are my best poems. Yeah. 
I can connect any two things. That's God. Teeny piece of Band-Aid, little folded piece of Band-Aid. I ran to the bathroom to see my face. Sometimes I don't want to see my face in the mirror. Sometimes I can't bear my thoughts. Sometimes I can't do anything, but that's okay. Band-Aid, book, God. That's right. I, w I used to work in the jazz room at um, the West End Bar, and it was very, I mean, like a whole long story, but I just, that thing where I noticed how both um, bass players made faces, and they were like, you know, like this thing. <laughs> there was just a whole bodily thing that accompanied um, the act of playing, playing a stand-up bass. And, and drummers taught, it would like hit, they would hit the cymbal and go, that's right, that's right, you know? Like they were just having this, um, you know, conversation. No, I'm not going to read that. Okay, I'm just going to read one, one more poem, and this is called My Box, which was a dirty word in grade school. And if you wanted to insult somebody, it was like horrible. It was a name for a girl. You know, you're talking about a girl's pussy, right? It was a box. And we would be mean, and we would go, box, to insult somebody as they walked across the room. And strangely, is it, and I'm going to really kill over introduce this poem, but um, <laughs> somehow it, it loved you know, it's sort of like this one thing about being female and being involved with women and then being involved intergenerationally. I've had a number of younger girlfriends, which meant that after I'd been through menopause, there was still Tampex around, but not mine, you know? And, um, and the design of the box would change, too. So you'd be, like, sitting in the bathroom, in the toilet, looking at, like, I never used that box. You know? It says nothing, it's only faintly part of the poem, but I like to tell that story. My box. I think I'm basically trying to control the word box by over-anecdotalizing it. In terms of design, one box is colored orange. The one you want it always is and sits in the bathroom of anyone's house because that's what she wants. It's choosing that wakes things up. I wondered how long all that I needed and encountered here would come like a wave. Not the shake, but the after effects. And this box did say there was a way to see this thing alone. July called it calculus. What is comes in boxes. What is not comes in waves. The dots between. Mountains surround us, and I say, they are more marvelous than the sea. Way overhead. I like flying over them, too, thinking, that is home, those crazy bumps. When we drive into them tomorrow, it won't be bam. It means swirling on the edge of a cup, and if you don't watch me like a hawk, I won't be scared. I want to be loved like a sunbeam. That is, it comes across the room or the ocean. You know the way I drive. I want to lift your fear like a bonnet and kiss your living face. Here, this is mine. Don't misunderstand me. Thanks. Electrify? Where's my ball? Yeah. Um, do you need to turn it on? I did turn it on, but I think I don't know where it is. So it's here. Right there. It should, so I should be. Hello? Yeah. Hello? Come Hello? On. Cool. That's good. Great. I'm happy to be here. Um, thank so, you all for coming. I'm uh, so happy you're here. So I'll have the hook now. Yeah. Just. Well, I've known uh, maybe I should start by talking a little bit about um, the context that I met you in. Okay. Uh, I was an undergrad at New College of Florida, so we were on my turf when we first met, and uh -huh. we were on your turf. Is this my uh, turf? This is kind of your turf, too. Uh, yeah. OK, my oh. temporary turf. Yeah. yeah, and I was an undergrad at New College of Florida doing programming, and I invited Eileen Miles to come, and that was the first time we met. Absolutely. And I remember um, all the young lesbians at my school went to the beach with you. Oh, gosh. And we all, snuck, we all um, went to eat Indian food afterwards, and I snuck a bunch of people onto the tab. I was only supposed to have, like, four people come oh. to dinner or something. Uh, and you lost your cell phone. But not permanent. No, you left your cell phone at the Indian restaurant, oh. and I had to mail it to you. Oh, but God. You, but you <laughs> 
<laughs> when you called, you left this great message on my answering machine when you were calling to tell me that you lost your phone. It was just this long, it was very Eileen Miles, it was this meandering uh, <laughs> message on my answering machine. I was like, okay. And then kind of at the end was the punchline about you losing your cell phone. But the Indian restaurant was already closed by the time you... Uh, now, I'm re now somehow that message makes me remember yeah. this whole thing. Well, way. there actually was, the best part was at the end of the message, there was an awkward pause, and then you just said, love you, at the end. <laughs> <laughs> Hung up, and I was like, oh, oh. Ellie Miles loves me. <laughs> um, so I thought that was great. Uh, <laughs> So around that time, I was reading um, The Importance of Being Iceland when I invited you. Um, and this book was important for me because I felt like it gave me permission to be conversational and extemporaneous. And, and that's, I think it's actually really great that we're in conversation right now because I think that um, you're one of my favorite talkers. Uh, so that book, and I think it, it's, it was mostly blog posts originally, the essays in that book. Yeah, it was a mix. I mean, all the, most of the art writing was blogs. Yeah. I, I blogged for some website for yeah. a couple of years or something. But it was just, yeah, it was like a lot of journalism mm -hmm. and then a big fat essay about Iceland. Yep, that was, um. yeah. Yeah, and then we spoke um, about a year or two after that, and um, I think you made this... Uh, Great comment. We can talk a little bit uh, about more today about being punk, about aging, um, and I just thought maybe a good place to start would be to kind of um, talk a little bit about uh, who you were in Boston, mm -hmm. um, how uh, you feel rooted or uh, in Boston, or who you were here versus who you were when, uh, or who you are in New York and how that changed. Um, we talked a little bit about this yesterday, but we right. can give the audience the backstory. I mean, the, the part, of the, part of my experience of looking back on, at, at least as a poet, um, or even as a, as a queer person, I feel like I, I sort of, I hadn't, I hadn't found anything or anyone, especially myself, yet when I lived in Boston, you know? So I just was like sort of young and amorphous and full of desire and, and um, you know, and sort of struggling with the, you know, the, the whole notion of being from a place and, and looking at my own and my friend's ambivalent relationships to it, to, you know, like to be, you know, Boston has such a kind of, fu you know, funny, um, segregated in some ways and class, you know, like, um, um, I don't even know how to put that, but you, you know what I'm saying. It's sort of like, an, and really occupied by so many universities, and so it's sort of like it's such a kind of educated town in a certain way, you know. And yet, it was very hard to find any wiggle room into um, a poetry world that that um, I didn't, you know, I didn't, you know, how it, a part of the problem is if you don't know what you're looking for, you don't know how to find it, you know. And so, I mean, what's strange, of course, is in retrospectively looking at Boston, there was so much here that I was sitting right next to at various points. But I didn't, there was, you know, like in my head, there was no there there. There was no, I mean, one of the things I've learned, like when my experience of Boston, which can't be the consummate truth about Boston, was that everybody I met sort of wanted to be something as opposed to like being it, kind of like a lot. I met a lot of cab drivers who wrote novels and dance, girls who were taking dance classes. And there was kind of a, we're on our way kind of way, you know, in Boston. But it's like, so, so and I was like that. And so I kind of wanted to get away from that. You know, I thought I have to go, obviously I have to go someplace else then to get there because it's not going to happen here. And I, you know, and when I landed in New York, I was mostly troubled by um, disbelief. You know, like I would meet people in my building and they would say, we got a band. And I would like, Ugh, a band on the fourth floor. And it was like Blondie, you know? <laughs> so it took me part of my education in New York and what I really lacked in Boston was this knowing that the local was something that there actually was something here. My presumption always was that there wasn't, you know, and I got to New York and, you know, I, I suppose there probably are, <laughs> New York is very much, you know, like, it's, you know, there's a lot of everything. So you can, it's not hard to find it either because everything is shouting its name in New York all the time. It's just a city about advertising itself. But, um, but it was, you know, it was harder to, you know, I just, I was kind of forming from the inside of Boston. And so just that 
condition of not knowing. And, I, and it's interesting, in New York, I've watched generations of people come to New York and still not, it's not just Boston, it's everywhere. It's like, people don't believe that the local is the thing. You know, they just think that there's some great thing and it's out there, it can't be you. You know, it can't be this person I'm talking to is, is you know, is the amazing thing. And, and so often, so they're missing the thing that's, you know, and likewise, you know, I'm an alcoholic and the joke about alcoholism is so many people will be sitting in a bar going, what's wrong with my life? <laughs> and it's like here, you couldn't, you know? And so I think it's very hard to kind of um, reconcile, you know, the there there with what being, the there there is what you want, you know? I mean, the problem, like that famous Gertrude Stein, I've been thinking about this a lot lately, the, the Stein line about there's no there there. The truth more often is that there is a there there, you just don't want to see it, you know? It's sort of like this kind of a, the kind of an erasure that is, is so then increasingly the condition, I think, of how we live, you know? So or too much there, there. What brought you to New York? And did you write poetry um, when you were in Boston? I did, I did yeah. OK. Yeah. yeah. I was just actually, when you're talking about, um, yesterday we were talking a little bit uh, about this question of whether or not people change over time and whether their personality is, is static or if people can have like a night and day kind of transformation. And I w when I was uh, reading Chelsea Girls recently, I was actually struck by uh, the beginning of the section, The Kid, um, where you're in seventh grade and you are given a punished task and in your head you're repeating Eileen Miles 500 times, I will not talk in the corridor corridors. Mm -hmm. And to me this, this seems to be announcing you as a writer or as someone who will not shut up even in Catholic school, you're being punished for talking in the corridors. Right, right. Um, and I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, your the emergence of your voice as a writer and how you discovered your writing voice. Yeah. I mean, my writing comes from keeping diaries, you know? It's just like I didn't even have my own room when I was growing up. And I remember, like, sitting out when I was given a a diary for the first time when I was 10 and sitting out in the hall under the light and writing in my notebook and it was the first time I felt like I had some space in my house you know it was just like oh my god you know and um, and I, I think you know I, 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 I think I was I was very good at art when I was a kid so I was supposed to go to art school mm -hmm. and that was and it was part dumb Eileen was gonna go to art school and that was what, what you know kind of <laughs> it was kind of great that I could draw um, but I just kind of but I had the brother you know the, the older brother who was very smart one, you know, and I really felt like I have to, you know, like I felt that this was untrue and that I was actually as intelligent. I went to college to prove that I was as smart as my brother. And, and, and what happened quickly was that instead of drawing everybody around me, I started to write poems just as my new mode of distraction. And after college, you know, when I was devastated because I thought I would, you know, like my brother and I were the first ones in the family to go to college and we thought we would be marching under the arch to the future of, you know, some other class, some other way of living. And instead I was doing the same shitty jobs, you know, like hostessing at the Fenway Moto Motel, working at the Pewter Pot, working at, you know, just like I work waitress every place in Harvard Square, you know, that existed then. And but what what, I, what what was interesting is at a certain point I realized that, so I was thinking, this is horrible. Why did I go to college, you know? But what I noticed that what I was actually doing, and the last job I had at Bo in Boston was working at Little Brown, and I, I was writing poems at work, you know? I was writing on my, you know, at my register, wherever, you know? And I thought, one day I wrote a poem, and I was like, oh my God, this is what I'm doing. I'm actually writing poems. This is what, you know, this could be my job and not this terrible place, you know? Uh -huh. And that was kind of, and that, that sort of sent me to New York, because at that moment I didn't know what to do next. I'd already gone to Europe and hitchhiked. I'd done all the things, like I've, I've been very aware of the fact that my generation is always, it may not be true with the next generations, but maybe it always is, that we were always doing the same thing. We're all going to Europe to hitchhike now. We're all <laughs> working at the Fernald School now. We're all, you know, doing uh, legal proofreading, you know, it's just like, during the, you know, during the boom phase of, of you know, um, selling, you know, American Airlines all night long and, you know, the whole buying and selling 80s. It's like everybody, 80s and 90s, everybody was, was you know, all the artists were sitting up all night long, you know, like proofreading the documents that they were you know, making to sell, to make the sale. And so anyway, there was always this collectivity. And so suddenly we were going to graduate school. And even though I had no feeling that I really wanted to go to graduate school, I didn't know how to move next. Mm -hmm. And so I applied to a bunch of schools. And one, the only one that took me was 
Queens College. And, and that was to do an MA in creative writing, which I quickly dropped out of and okay. just became a New So Yorker. there was, you did not, when you had that realization when you were writing poems on the receipts, which I actually used to do when I was a cashier at a grocery store, I would write on the receipts, uh, also worked at a motel in Florida. Um, but you, when you had that recognition, like, oh, I'm writing poems. I could be a writer. This could be the thing that I do. You didn't resist it. You just went with it. Yeah, yeah. And you know what's funny? You know, my, my role model as a poet, since I didn't know any poets, Seymour Glass, like in J.D. Salinger novels, you yeah. know, there was this whole fictionalized account of the poet. And he would write on receipts. Yep. And everybody, he was so oblivious to fame and aspiration that he would leave you know, like poems on scraps of paper in his pockets, and his family would all look and find these beautiful, you know, and I thought, oh, I want to be, I'm like that, uh -huh. you know? Wow, I, you know. I can write poems on receipts. I could leave shit in my pocket and <laughs> have it discovered well, maybe we by can other people. We can talk a little bit about um, the life of the poet. Uh, reading Chelsea Girls recently, um, I was actually struck by the, the rhythm of the text um, and, and the rhythm of, of your life and how that mirrors the rhythm of the text. So throughout the book, people are taking speed, you're chasing girls, stealing vitamins, uh, walking slowly, drinking coffee, eating hot dogs. Um, and I just wondered if you that's such a that great list, like. <laughs> by the way. That was fabulous. Just when I thought I knew what you were doing, you changed it. It was good. Well, I was actually um, on the bus here. I was thinking about this um, comment that Ben Lerner made um, during uh, the Q&A when he read uh, for an event that the Woodbury Poetry Room co-sponsored. And someone asked him about his process. And he started talking about Walt Whitman, how Walt Whitman writes about loafing all the time, and, and he was saying that um, in order to write America, you need to be porous, you need to be observing what's going on around you. So the task of the poet is kind of to, lo to loaf and remain porous in some ways. Mm. I don't know. I mean, obviously we write poems too, but I just wonder if um, you could speak a little bit about um, life rhythms and writing. Yeah, I think, I'm so glad you said poor is not poor. Yeah, no. It's just like, <laughs> truly, you know? Right. Like that cliche about the poet is just yeah. not helpful. And, yeah, and true. You know. mm -hmm. um, but yeah, no, I think that's true. I mean, I, th I think, because the truest thing about the poet is that the studio is in your head. You know, it's not like, you know, my friends who are visual artists, there's just that struggle to get space and to, you know, you have to be able to run a studio and stuff. And the thing that's interesting, about being a poet is that that you don't have that burden at all, you know, and so it's sort of like what you carry is what you're working with, you know. But the condition of that is yeah. really important, right. you know. So you really have to. I mean, like all the ways that people, you know, we don't even hear about it so much now. Un unplugging, you know, the various ways that of, of not, you know, or or riding the waves of too much media mm -hmm. and using it. Like I really found that that exci it's exciting to write to leave lines on Twitter, you know, to just kind of like write as I go a lot. And I don't, you know, sometimes I think, oh, this is destroying my poetry. And I've tried assembling my tweets and, and sometimes, sometimes they kind of work and sometimes, I mean, but they're actually no worse than all the lines I would find in my notebook if they were just sort of fragmented and shattered, you know? So I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm always, I'm sort of like, you know, varying it from really needing to push things away and then finding, of course, that I then don't do the right thing. You know, it's sort of like to, to get organized for today, I kept making time and then I would find myself either cleaning my apartment or reading War and Peace, which I'm just currently addicted to, you know, or just doing anything but writing, you know, but I think still clearing out that space means that, that there's just kind of a, you're welcoming it, you know, and you know, you just can't be, you just can't be utterly, utterly busy unless you've decided to be that poet. Oh, I know. This is something that I've talked about um, with my analyst a bit about uh, the rhythm of, of graduate school and how that kind of forces me onto a wavelength that isn't really conducive to writing poetry because it's constant grind. The next assignment, the next book, the next hurdle, the next hoop to jump through. Yeah, so I don't know. That's that's helpful, though. I think I'm gonna have to do some mental spring yeah. cleaning. I, I have one thing to add too, which is funny because um, 
um, I think that a lot of friends of mine who teach, and I, I teach sometimes, it's just like, you know, so you're teaching workshops, and, but then the problem with that is you've got to figure out how to not have to read their work, you know? <laughs> because you're just, you're like the sad poet going home with hundreds and hundreds of poems, you know? <laughs> so I think, but what I see is a lot of people, and especially my younger friends who are adjuncting at five schools, you know, it's like, when would they ever write? And so this is the reward for being a poet, you get to, read everybody else's fledgling work. But what pe but a lot of people I know are starting to do is turn the workshop into a studio situation. So you write in class. And so what that means is the poet running the class also writes. So you kind of, we were talk talking earlier about scholars who blithely assign their own books to their students. And as a poet, you can't really do that because it's sort of gross saying, oh, look, look at this amazing poem of mine you know, in my <laughs> book. It just doesn't. But what you can do is appropriate their work time. Yeah. You know, and make it and assign them to write poems that actually you need to write, and then you write it with them. You know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so I get you get them to kind of advance your work in a certain way and and be the studio. Yeah, yeah, yeah. be the studio. Um, let's see here. Can you tell me what it was like uh, appearing in the Boston Globe and? I just, I just thought. I mean, I remember seeing it, the yeah. newspaper. Actually, I like walked into the math department, and I just saw a huge picture of you in the Boston yeah. Globe. Um, and you, we talked a little bit about right. it when you were here doing the pop. Yeah, pop. no, just being in the Globe meant yeah. the most, just because you know it was the paper that was on the breakfast table every morning growing up, and it was like, oh my god, you know, and there was like even a picture of us on standing on Swan Place in Arlington in our little, you know six-year-old clothes. I was like, this is crazy that that's in the Boston Globe. This is, you know, so yeah, no, it's almost, kind of almost better than having a poem in the New Yorker. Almost better than having a <laughs> Like all those words are did there. Your, did your family read it or was, uh, how did yeah, my people family's react? Or funny. people you knew and People school? I knew, people I went to high school with read it They're in like, grade school. They oh, read it. You're a writer? Or were people surprised? They were, they were impressed that I was in the Globe. Uh -huh. <laughs> they were less impressed by me. They were impressed that I, whatever is me was in the globe was what they were excited about. You know. So what is it like for you being back here doing this residency? Really sweet and really exciting and almost pornographic. Pornographic. Like, and I, I mean, I just don't know what that word means except that like when I was a child, I mean, I didn't, A, as a young person in Boston, I just was already such a problem drinker that nobody would let me drive. You know, I just drove my mother's Falcon once down Mass Ave and you know, scraped the car next to me, knocked off the drain pipe of the house. Nobody would trust me driving. And so I had no, I was just like a child and a passenger in Boston. So driving around Boston and seeing, you know, like Teal Square, you know, Dane Street. I was like, everything is like lurid, you know, and just brings back the history of learning to read and mm -hmm. moments, even like the poem I read about, um, there was a bus between, you know, like being on a bus and falling asleep and being a waitress, which was like, I think I worked at the worst house that used to be in Harvard Square. And, you know, I'd get, get drunk at work and get on the bus and fall asleep, you know, and this sweet guy drove me. But what's so strange is that driving around the other day, I was like, oh my God, this is where the bus stopped. You know, and I think it's not even where the buses stop anymore in Somerville, you know, but it was like, it was just, it's such a, you know, memories are just so mm -hmm. visceral and weirdly planted that when they, when they wake up, you know, it's almost, it's not even something you could do writing with. It's more a, mm -hmm. it's more a human body thing, you yeah. know, but it's, it's so deep being here for me. You know? What was Harvard Square like when, when you lived here? It was really cool. <laughs> it was paradise. It was like, take the bus from Arlington to Harvard Square and just like, because there was an ice cream store, Brigham's, that everybody, people probably remember, but it was a chain. And before it was pink and blue, it was wood, you know, like they had the highest booths, really high, dark wood booths. Right, the pewter pot right, in, I mean, the, the, the Brigham's right in Harvard Square, right at the corner. It was like, I mean, it was, people were selling drugs in there. It was just like the, it was so high that you could be down there like, you know, and, and, and I didn't, I went high school, I didn't take drugs, but I was very excited by the fact that that was going on. And then it was all carved, you know, like his, you know, and stuff, and everything, Club 47. I mean, when I think about what I didn't do, because I, again, I wasn't into blues, so I was like, Lightning Hopkins, who's that? I was like, oh my God, you know, or the, you know, so hard, I mean, it was the Club 47, everything, it was so, it was so incredibly, like, it was just an education to be here. It was, it was so hip, mm -hmm. you know. And how does it feel now? 
Well, it's like a lot, a lot is covered, a lot is gone. You know, I mean, it's sort of like it's still, you know, there's still obviously something. The bones of the place are still similar. And, and then sometimes the mixes of people look somewhat similar. But, you know, like this kind of large underclass that's not here. And then when you see, you know, homeless people, in they really stick out more because there isn't this in-between. You know, it seems like everybody's well except for the unwell, mm -hmm. you know, and that's, you know, that's hard. Yeah. I mean, you even know. since I've been here, I remember um, Dana Ward has a poem where he mentions the Harvard Square Aubon Pen. And when Harvard Square Aubon Pen closed like a month ago, yeah. I felt like it was the end of a chapter, even though I've only been here for like two years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So let's uh, open it up to questions from the audience if we have a few minutes. And we have a mic also. Not to make you on the spot or anything. <laughs> Or even comments. <laughs> when are you going to Australia? And uh, what do you have plans for Australia? Where do you want to go? I'm going in May, yeah. Hmm. I'm going, it's so great. I'm, going, I'm flying to New Zealand, and then I'm going to Melbourne, and then I'm going to Sydney, and then I'm going to Adelaide. So, I mean, it's, it's basically, this, the Sydney Biennial invited me, and so they're having like a writing part of, part of, you know, they're, they're, right, writing is hot. It's very weird. It's always poetry. It's, it's poetry is hot. Poetry is hot in the art world. Oh, you know, can okay. You feel it in Rome? <laughs> <laughs> but it's like somehow we're like a new uh, space that nobody quite knows what to do with, and the fact that it hmm. exists. But but so there's a writing component to the um, to Sydney Biennial, and that's what brought me over. But then the other ones are colleges, you know, University of New Zealand, and you know, Sydney U, and, and stuff. But I'm, I'm you know, I've wanted to go to Australia forever, so. First time? Yeah. And I'm gathering. It's so weird. Once you're going someplace, then it starts being out on social media. And now when I go around the country doing readings, Australians are coming forward. It's like, Australians are reading in Mel Melbourne. <laughs> <laughs> and telling me what I should do and everything. So it's kind of, it's, it's, it's right away, it's sort of, the place comes to you um, by going, by even before I get there. You know? I'll go look at you. Feel so official now. Um, one of the things that I just actually finished Chelsea Girls probably three weeks ago, um, and that was my first experience with your writing, um, and I loved it. I thought it was really moving, and I thought it was really awesome to just get that kind of perspective and rawness. Um, from a woman in the 70s, and I just connected with it a lot. Um, another thing I connected with today was the writing on the receipt papers. I worked in retail. I quit my job probably two days ago, but I used to write on receipt papers a lot. So my question is, what do you have for somebody, or advice, I should say, for a young writer who doesn't know what the heck they're doing with their life? Oh. <laughs> and how to pursue it, I guess. I don't know. Yes. very undecided, but you know, your work is so inspiring, and I just kind of want to hear how you got to that end zone of just pursuing it. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think, you know, like, I, I always think read a lot. You know, like, it's sort of like, I mean, it's just like really, and, and if people say you really got to read this person and you start to read it and you think, I don't get it, just miss it. You know, because there's so much, everybody will tell you what to read and everybody will tell you what you need to know. And and that's sort of like, I think the thing, you know, it's like there are writers, there are writers that, like, I'm reading Kafka now. You know, it's like when I was growing up, it was, everybody was Kafka. You know, I was like, I don't want to read Kafka, you know? And so I found myself being the person in her 60s reading Metamorphosis and thinking, whoa, you're at Metamorphosis? <laughs> like, I was crazy. But I think it's so, like to really be on your own time and to mm -hmm. totally respect your, your embodied opinion, you know? Mm -hmm. It's sort of like, it doesn't feel good to you. There's so, much, there's so much else, you know? So I think it's like, you know, like respecting your own taste and letting, letting that guide you is really important. And when you find something, read lots of it, you know, and, and not to be afraid of being influenced. Because I think it's like influence mm -hmm. is just like thrifting. You know, you just put on a shirt, and you're like, this is my green shirt for about a year, and then you're like, this is not my green shirt. <laughs> but it's sort of all like a pastiche of, of multiple, of, uh, you know, writers, you know, and I think it's sort of like to be not frightened. Influence is a great thing, you know. And um, you had a tenure track job at the uh, UC San Diego, correct? Yeah. Can you talk about um, leaving that and whether that felt like a, 
a decision to not be an academic poet? Um, well, I felt like um, part of the thing about being, I mean, I've taught a lot and I love teaching, but part of the thing of being faculty is that you're expected to do the business of the university. Mm -hmm. You know, the different, I mean, like, it, you'd be like an adjunct for years growling because they're getting, you know, benefits and great pay and all that. But what you don't realize is they're just doing everything. You know, and um, and I found that I mean, like, I, and my nature was to do it. You know, like it's like I like I'm social. I like organizations. I know how to do work. You know, and so, but I noticed I, I it didn't stop me from writing, and it didn't stop me. Um, so I was productive, and I loved you know the benefits of being part of a department and being in a university. But I was doing their business rather than mine. Mm -hmm. You know, and there just is a component of being a writer which is quote career. We don't like to talk about it, mm -hmm. but it's really real. You know, there are things that you sort of need to do and. You only have so much energy, so I just thought I was I was in my I got hired at fifty, so I was like a, I came into the academy as a real you know piece late, and so I really thought you know I only have so many lives, you know, and so I thought I'd rather do my business than theirs, and that's why I left. Mm -hmm. yeah. Plus, I thought this is this is like the second most punk thing I've ever done in my life. <laughs> to <be> tenure. <laughs> 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 okay, so this one right here. You right there. Yes, you. Okay. I want to know if you feel about boredom and what you what you do in response to it. Right, right. Yeah. Good um, question. I try to go to the gym. Because <laughs> I think boredom is just sort of an in-between state. I think it really is kind of fake. You know? I do. I do. I think it's sort of like depression. And you just sort of in between, it's like you're not quite, you're, you're probably sad, but you're not quite feeling it, and you're like, your energy is a little weird, and you're not going here. I mean, boredom is just this un, un, unable to invest state. Mm -hmm. What do you say? So it just looks so I think you need to shake something up. You know, when I was younger, you know, I would use drugs and alcohol, or I would go for a long walk, you know, and now I try to, I try to go to the gym, you know. Just say, yeah, because often I'll be on a treadmill and suddenly I'm in a rage. <laughs> you know, like, what's that? You know, so there's just an inarticulate thing going on, which is boring. Oh, true, true. My mind. Yeah. There's two of them in this row. <laughs> um, I have kind of a frivolous question, possibly. Um, when all those sort of a series of super Boston-y movies came out, Mystic River, blah, 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 right. I was thinking how much I would love it if someone had assigned you to write poem reviews of them or consult or anything. Did you have any, you know, did it e echo somewhere? Did you think about that? Or? Uh, no, I no, 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 and I agree with you. I would love to have written about it, and I, because I watched every single one of them. I was very excited about it, and, and it was interesting. Um, uh, what's his name? Ben? Not. Uh, yeah, Casey. Casey Affleck? No. Ben Affleck, ben Affleck. Is, is sort of is kind of an interesting filmmaker. Not entirely, but he gets his his <laughs> Boston. His Boston is beautiful. I mean, it was almost like that was the experimental filmmaker in him. His 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 way of, of seeing it. It was gorgeous, though not necessarily the plots and you know what happened. You know, and, I, and it was weird. I mean, I guess it's sort of part of the you know part of the social network. I mean, there's a little sort of an obsession with, you know, like pederasty. I was like, is that the only story in Boston? You know, like whitey and pederasty. You know, like, you know, what about a female story? You know, I mean, but, but I mean, still it was compelling because I think it, there's a way in which it's like, it's a small city, you know, and there's a lot of this sort of unknown about Boston, you know, and so I thought, that, you know, like the Boston's conflicts and was really, it was exciting to me, you know, but of course the bad Boston accents were amazing. <laughs> you know, it's really, I think it's a tough accent to imitate, you know, and, and, and there at Wabi Jack Nicholson was terrible. I mean, he didn't even try, <laughs> but the fighter was great. I thought that was an amazing one, you know. I think that's not a frivolous question. And then your friend sitting next. Um, I just was wondering about something that you said in response um, earlier about memories and when you've been back, since you've been back in Boston and walking around and feeling this visceral kind of experience and you said there are certain things you can't write and I was just wondering if you, if, if you really felt that way that that experience might not be possible to express in writing. Well, you know, like what you can't write about now, later you can. 
You know, I mean, I just, I, I you know, I sort of, even, you know, there was even the, doing this event today, I felt like there was an absurdity because I thought, I'm just like here having this incredible feeling and, and, you know, and having active conversations with people literally about, but there was a way in which to gurge it up. I mean, it was just, I thought this is, you know, going to take a year or years, you know? Um, and so just like writing, writing is just like in the same way we're talking about like what you read. It's sort of like, you don't really get to choose entirely what you write and, and certainly not when you write it. You know, like I've had stories that were from my life that, that, I just knew that was an amazing story, and it took 20 years for me to find find a rhythm in which it could come out. You know, it's almost like it just the doors are. I think the doors are almost naturally closed, and it's like you have to figure out how to jog them. You know, and and again, you don't figure it out consciously. It just it kind of happens a bit, and then you you don't stop it mostly. You know. So, but I think the being is the most important part: is to put the body in the place, and then have the sensations, and then figure out when they mm -hmm. express. Yeah. Can I make this um, going crazy. <laughs> <laughs> then it goes to you. Yeah. I just wanted to tell you a very short story rather than ask a question. My first job out of college was at Harvard Bookstore, and my fellow bookseller and I um, just loved your work. And um, we got in really big trouble repeatedly for having books find the register because we would be distracted when customers needed help. Right. And so um, our manager finally just banned books behind the register. So we started cutting things out. And once we just cut out a bunch of your poems and taped them to the desk, and they were there for years. Some of them might still be there, but <laughs> my, my friend, um, when she left and went to grad school in uh, Oregon, she scraped peanut butter, your poem peanut butter, not actual peanut butter, <laughs> off of the desk and, um, and taped it to it? her. What? And discarded it? No, no, she taped it to her giant notebook and she called me the other day and just to say hi and I said, oh, I'm going to see our favorite poet, Eileen Miles, and she said, oh, I've transferred peanut butter from <laughs> that notebook to every notebook and planner that I've used in grad school and it's going to carry me through my PhD. It's on the cover of my notebook always. Oh. So. <laughs> I didn't even know this <laughs> Back here. This, this. It's not a guitar case, but it's still. <laughs> right, right. Um, it's a wonderful story. I also work at the Harvard Bookstore, and we not only still read behind the register, I don't know, things have changed but not changed. Um, I have a question about poetry. You said that um, standardized spelling is sort of language without the body, which I think is true and wonderful. And um, how do you, I'm thinking about your poems on the page in a visual way. Is there a way in which you fight against that, or like how, how does the visual dimension of poetry work with the auditory things that you're exploring. Do you mean the part which is line breaks or the part which is just how the words form? Both. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, I visually, it's like I, I think of them as sort of like denoting speed rather than, you know, it's sort of like the line breaks don't mean stop here at all. Mm -hmm. Though sometimes stanzas mean silence, you know, I like mm -hmm. to think the sound ceases and then I kind of, and I've gotten more permissive with myself as a reader in like adhering to how I actually imagine that, you know, because at first you, just, you so many, I mean, there's so many different layers of permission in becoming a writer, right? You know, it's sort of like, how do you learn how to read? You sort of learn how to read by watching other people. And then slowly you start to think, well, I don't really feel like that and, and kind of adjusting. And so I've really given myself time. I mean, like at first, nobody moved their hands. So I was like, I'm not going to move my hands, you know? And then slowly I've, I've become very illustrative. You know, because I think when I talk, I always wave my hands around. Mm -hmm. So slowly I've given myself permission to do that. And that's not on the page, you know. And um, and I'm starting to use, I mean, I, for, I really never wanted to use, um, I mean, certainly I'm not going to make sounds, you know, like the vowel sounds that I was talking about be represented. But even things like gonna, I started to think, you know, I, I hate when I do an interview and then they transcribe it as gonna. I feel like they're just, they're just talking about class. They're just like, look how... You know, look how she, talk, you know, and but but increasingly, not always, but every I mean, it's like a big debate when I'm like writing a poem or, or you know, I think gonna actually, maybe gonna's great, 
Well, you've done this great, but it's, all, it's poem by poem. You know, sometimes it seems so important that people hear Ghana, and that's part of the, the system of the poem, you know? So it's just like, but I think part of it is part of not using, um, you know, I mean, I do have certain things that I have, like cause, you know, and cause is, it's so funny, like there's a COS cause, you know, that people, mm -hmm. I don't like mm -hmm. that at all, you know? Um, and then there's a cause with an apostrophe, and I really don't like that. You know, but when I, I read Gertrude Stein's lectures in America when I was like 24, and she just gave me all kinds of permission somehow in that mm -hmm. book, and I just thought, cause is better. It's just better, you know? But sometimes you want because, sometimes you want the two syllables. But I've given my, I mean, I fight with editors increasingly now because I'm me, you know, and before, though I was me, nobody knew I was me. Now I <laughs> increasingly have permission to use cause. And they don't, you know, but sometimes at the last minute they put in an apostrophe and it really pisses me off. You know? <laughs> but mostly I, I really didn't want to go away from standard English on the page so that what would, what would um, stray was me, you know, mm -hmm. that I would be the, you know, the, 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 you know, the fact of me would be the, the real life of the poem. And the, the poems in, on some level would die with me, which I kind of loved. You know, but now we have recording, so it's a whole other thing. We're going to take maybe one more question. But I just wanted, you know, your mic has sort of died. Uh, so My mic is mine? Your mic has sort of... Just so nobody heard anything I said. <laughs> um, uh, so we might just have her answer it on this thing. The last question. I get the, the, last I get the big phallus. <laughs> <laughs> so just shout the question. Can these two people be the last question? Yeah, just... Hello. I can shout. Hello. I don't think this is. A uh, what I'm curious about is, you know, what year did you go to New York, and what did you find there? Did you find a community, and did you know Ginsburg? Who did you meet? Okay. And how hard was it to connect with that community? Okay. And who's the other question? I'll ask the most questions together. Um, and what's yours? I have a question about assimilation. Uh, you're talking about, um, and by the way, I loved your talk and this. <coughs> Thank you. Um, and you were saying how you know the poetry world has been kind of brought into the art world, and I was thinking about Transparent, which I think is a, just a brilliant show. Um, I was just wondering, like, how you kind of feel about sort of cultural assimilation, being assimilated to a larger culture. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Like, um, sort of being on the margins and then kind of being brought into. Right. Right. How that you know, um, as a lesbian, as a queer, like all of those things. Yeah. Do you have any kind of opinion on that? Right, right. Do you see kind of like an erosion of the margins in some way? And, and what, maybe what do you think that might mean for, I don't know, the future? Right, right. I mean, personally, I mean, I just, just, uh, it, but I'll answer both questions. Personally, I just feel like it's, I'm too old, it's too late for me to be ruined, just as an artist. <laughs> I've been ruined for so long that it's just like being subsumed into the mainstream couldn't hurt. But, um, but I, came, I came to New York in 1974, and I just sort of, you know, like at the time, it was pre-internet. So it was just like the back of the Village Voice listed every poetry reading in New York. You know, it was before, I mean, later that got come out, there was like a poetry newsletter that had all the, but at first it was just like, it was there in the voice, and then there were columnists in the Village Voice who were poets. So it was just like, it was just this open party for poets at that time. And then so after a year of just following and going to every like loser poetry scene in New York and thinking, oh, this is weird. I have to hang out with really weird people to be a poet. But I was like, if that's what I must do, I will do it, you know? <laughs> And then I always start off thinking, oh, I'm going to have to date really weird women now that I'm a lesbian. And then I was just like, no, you don't. It's just always I'm going to have to read stupid books because, you know. But it's just like, but, but, but I, I gravitated through a few accidents to a St. Mark's Church. And it was like the aesthetic that like just totally was, was mine, you know. And it was just like New York School poetry was so exciting to me. James Scholar, Frank O'Hara, and, and Patti Smith came out of the Poetry Project, you know, and so that was amazing. And so everybody was, you know, it was a small, I mean, it's always a smaller, because I remember in the 70s looking at photographs of the poets in the 50s, and it would be a small room, you know, or it seemed that way. I mean, it wasn't a small room, but they all knew, same thing, they all knew each other. So very quickly at St. Mark's Church, it was like, you, you would meet Allen Ginsberg, you would meet Alice Notley, you would meet, you know, um, John Ash, we were just like everybody, you know, it was just sort of like there was kind of an agreement because it was the part of the poetry world that had a link with the art world and a kind of a cultural, because it was the outsider school. So outside means 
interestingly, weirdly connected to other outsides. You know what I mean? There was a way just by it's not being, at that time it wasn't an academic poet. I mean, like now the whole poetry world, you know, with I say with the onset of language poetry, it became the first avant-garde poetry um, school that went right into the academy, you know, because it was the, th the th their theory, you know, I mean, I, I, we, I like theory too, but it was sort of like its needs, you know, the needs of the academy and the needs of language poetry worked really good. You know, and so that was a, you know, that was, you know, um, a, a shift. But it was also the same time that it was a shift in real estate, a shift in the corporate nature of the university, you know, just everything, you know, the media changed, the, the, you know, the internet, everything changed, you know, by the 90s, you know, but and started in the 80s. But it, it, it was still like, you know, it was like I, I got there mid 70s, so it was still kind of a very, you know, like, we're hanging out, you know, and so, and if you, if you were willing to hang out, and I was very good at hanging out, you know, you would meet everybody, you know? So it was, it was, I was lucky I came at the end of something and it was a good time. And, and the thing about, I mean. Uh, the question was about the, um, the, the main, well, see, I think, I mean, I do think. Is this dying now? No. I mean, I do think that poetry is hot and I mean this truly. I mean, I just think because of social media, I mean, because, because social media is not, is this something, okay. It's almost like I'm looking, I'm having sex with this thing. <laughs> it's good here, no, it's good here, no, go here. Okay. Um, I, I think that the, the, because we're, tweets are, are is a form, yeah. you know? It's sort of like the, the very limitation of how we use language in social media is in, or the captioning is, is an inherently avant-garde gesture of, you know, like in, in you know, in, in, on Instagram, it's a picture and now you're captioning the picture or in Twitter, it seems like it's the phrase, but you're, you know, like you're visualizing them. So I think all that kind of movement is, is like what poets have been doing all along. So I think, and I think it's giving us more ways to be out and be part of the culture. And I think it's, it just coincided with some of those cultures, like for instance, the art world, you know, picking up on us. So part of the thing about, you know, that was just kind of like um, an accident because I was on a I was on a panel with Jill Soloway, you know, and then Jill started researching me and stuff, and then it became, you know, but but the bigger joke was that there was a hole that was lesbian poet shaped, you know, that which was like that they were already doing an episode, you know, about a lesbian poet, and then the writers were like, this sounds like somebody I worked with in San Diego was in the writing room, and she was like, this sounds like Eileen Miles. You know, so it's just like there was an Eileen Miles shaped hole, you know, but it's sort of like, you know, but a, with a career, you know, you had to get to that. But I think, but, but I think it was like, but I also think that people, I mean, I've gotten a lot of attention because people were excited by the idea of poetry being out there, you know, and I think part of the reason you're excited is because poetry is out there. It just wasn't manifest kind of, because I feel like when I think about growing up, what was the most exciting thing in the world was beatniks. You know, yet how they were represented was on television, like there was a character named Mina G. Krebs on a TV show called Dobie Gillis. You know, I'm deeply inf influenced by that show. You know, it was written by a guy named, um, let's see, what makes, what was his name? Jew he was a playwright. Um, anyway, it was just like, you know, it was, it was a really good playwright writing the TV show. And, and it started off with this kind of like, he would sit in front of a statue and thinker and talk about, about girls. He would say, what is it about Thalia Menninger? And Chelsea Girls, it's just that. It's just like Dobie Gillis. You know, it's just like, I was like, does, a, does I mean, I'm not Jewish, but I'm like, you know, a pseudo Jew. I mean, I'm a New Yorker and a lover of Jews. And, and it's just like, it's sort of like, and just the kind of abject nerdiness of the Jewish, Jewish male, I feel like I totally identify with, you know? And so it's just like, but I just, I'm not sure I'm answering your question at all. But I just think it's sort of like, I think it's just like the mainstream exists and we exist. And it, it's just like, I don't know, you float in, you float out. I mean, I think even be, as a poet being commodified, it still doesn't mean that over here they're like, what, what is that? You know, it's sort of like, for, I mean, if I've gotten so much attention this year, but all those National Book Award, it wouldn't touch me. You know, because I've gone from being obscure poet to famous poet. But that still doesn't mean that somehow this is an important poet. You know, it's just you're still struggling with the same issues. And I think the value happens in its own strange way. You know, so it's like you're never, I mean, the, and that's the beauty. I think you're never winning in all the rooms, you know. And the, in, the relationship of the small room to the big room is really interesting. And I think it's sort of like we all have connections. And it's just a question of, it's like that's like the monkeys typing. It's like what room will, at what moment will all the monkeys start typing you? 
you know. And <laughs> one of the poets, in, one of the poets who had a column in the Village Voice said, um, somebody said, well, his name was Joel Oppenheimer. We don't know who he is today, but he was very famous in the 70s. And somebody said, how did you become Joel Oppenheimer? And he said, well, if you stand around long enough, you're always, you're bound to attract a crowd, you know. So, and I think with the whole internet, the way the social media is arranged, it's just like this lot of crowds everywhere. So it's just like, Bye. <laughs>